the more important thing than uh, winning prizes or, or than the contest or um, competing against other people is the fact that it's just a really good opportunity to practice. Uh, so getting these multi-tracks for a song that maybe you haven't heard before uh, unless you watch the video and, and being able to, to go through that. And also, you know, being able to watch you mix the song in the video and then apply some of those things is really fun. I, I mean, I wish, I wish that this had been available to me, um, you know, as I was, as I was coming up, cause this, I mean, it would be invaluable to be able to just even just play around with stuff, you know, that, that, yeah, yeah I'm blown away. This is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, the tracks are recorded so well too. And, um, one of the things that we, we hear sometimes from, from people in feedback is, okay, it's great that you guys have these tracks that are recorded in these amazing studios by these amazing engineers, but how does that relate to my life? And um, the the answer for that is it's it's extremely valuable to be able to pull up the multi-track from something like um, like with you tracking drums on it and be able to listen to phase relationships, listen to the dimension of the tracks and, and how those things are recorded as a benchmark for, you know, improvement to where you can get your tracks. So, right. Um, and if it, it was me tracking it, so I probably screwed up a bunch of stuff because <laughs> I, I like to uh, I like to paint myself in the corners, you know, so. Um, yeah. I mean, who I, I I haven't listened to basic tracks in a minute. Who knows? It could have been a hot mess. It was it was pretty awesome actually. It was fun watching you go through them in the video too. Um, there were just some crazy like crazy room tracks and all kinds of stuff that was blown up and committed yeah. that way. The hot um, Carl probably. Don't Google that. Kids. Do not Google that. <laughs> yeah, especially right now, because then you're gonna have to come back and look at us, and it's just gonna be weird. Yeah, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be iffy. Cool. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, uh, do you remember much from the tracking session? Um, I remember zero from the tracking session. Um, but it was probably either at ocean way or at blackbird. Mm -hmm. I don't recall which, um, I think you yeah, said you ocean know, way was, in the, in the video. Was it at ocean way? Yeah. Okay. That means there's probably far room mics that were nearly unusable or just really, really big. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Yeah. So that was at ocean way and that was some of the guys that were playing on that were a couple of the guys from Eric church's band. Oh, cool. Um, you know, I think Lee, the bass player and the, and the Craig, the drummer, um, I think those were the guys that were playing on it. And I don't remember who played guitars. It was probably somebody like Jed, hmm. uh, yeah, um, yeah. So Ocean Way, I mean, you know, Ocean Way is ridiculous. It's a church with the largest Neve eighty seventy eight in the world in it. Yeah. Uh, but to be honest, the last couple times I've gone, I've, we've taken pictures and I've gone back and looked, and you know, I mean, I'm only using probably twenty four channels of it, and usually there's only like five or six EQs on. Wow. You know. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it's just a great room and great players, and you know, just a nice console. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. Were you, so you were also involved with the production of the song, right? Yeah, and in an ancillary fashion, you know, the producer uh, is a guy named Ross Copperman, and he's a he's a really he's a good friend. He's a really well known uh, songwriter producer. Mm -hmm. In fact, he and I just he and I just started a uh, we just started a charity putting um, like songwriting and music creation studios in high schools. Oh, for, cool. Uh, with with successful writers so like we went back to his high school in virginia and you know installed a studio for the kids to learn how to do production and learn how to do engineering and podcasting and video stuff and you know just trying to trying to give back a little bit wow so check awesome. it out yeah it's called songfarm.org um so, so ross uh, ross almost all the time starts with um uh tracks you know um so he probably came to the studio with a bunch of tracks on that song and I probably turned almost all of them off and then he probably turned about half of them back on and we would fight back and forth. And, um, and then once we get in the studio, I kind of get to, to run amok a little bit and, and call out stuff and try stuff. And I remember on that, on that particular song, there were a couple of fun things. I believe, well, first of all, there's that main hook. Right, mm -hmm. the bow and we layered like tons and tons of garbage on that. I, I'd have yeah. to look at the Pro Tools session, but there's at least two guitars. I know I played some keys on that. Mickey Raphael came in and played harmonica in the mix room, like right behind nice. me, right here. <laughs> um, 
you know, we just layered, we layered a bunch of stuff on that kind of doing the, the, the idea was like Brian Wilson used to do that layered bunch of different instruments to make something that's not just one instrument, but it's kind of just its own thing. Right. Um, I remember doing that. And I think, I also think we did something, some kind of overdub or something where we put a hi hat on top of the snare and use it as a, like a clack kind nice. of sound. Yeah. And, um, I was listening back to my mix this morning today and I, and there's some claps on the verse two, which is probably my, uh, I don't think I have it here. I, I have this um, analog box called a clap trap, which you know made awesome percussion noises. So I'm I'm uh, 99 nice. percent sure it's that. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. And uh, in the video, you mentioned that the song almost didn't get on the record, right? Like you didn't want to make yeah, it. Yeah, there was uh, there was some doubt I think in Dirks's mind that it was a little too um playful or a little too shallow or you know i mean a little mm -hmm. too whatever and and um yeah we had a nice argument um on the couch that's right behind me me and ross and dirks about like you know he was like man i don't know if this song's gonna go on the record and and we were like are you fucking crazy man this thing is a hit right uh, sorry i don't know if i'm allowed to curse on oh you're fine <laughs> <laughs> Um, but fortunately, he changed his mind because it actually ended up being one of the uh, obviously definitely the biggest hit of that record wow. of that summer and one of the bigger songs in his career. And, you know, he loves playing it now because it's so much fun. You know, yeah. he's a total yeah. he's a total awesome guy and a goofball. And it totally fits him that he sings this tongue in cheek song about being drunk on a plane. The irony being um, he he's a pilot. Mm, so. Really? And he flies himself to like all of his gigs and stuff. So he is never drunk on a plane. Right. Ever. In <laughs> fact, he can't even drink a day before he does that. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. But uh, yeah, it was a really fun song. I, I, it was, it's very rare when you're in the studio, when you're, when you're doing tune and as you're doing it, you're like, this is going to be a number one hit. Like this is a hit yeah. and you never really know. But this one, this was one of the ones where I'm like, this is a hit. Yeah. And fortunately we were right. That's that's pretty awesome. That was gonna be my next question actually, is um just you know, when do you have that feeling of, of man, we're working on something special right now? And very rare, very rare. Yeah. But every once in a while, you know, and I don't know why a friend of mine asked me the other day, they actually watched a pure mix video and they're like, How did you know it's a hit? And I was like, I don't know. I it just felt I mean it was just everything kind of fell into place. It's yeah. you know, it's just a really fun song it makes you feel good when you listen to it yeah yeah that's usually a good indicator <laughs> yeah so um we had a bunch of pre-submitted questions and we're also going to okay. be taking questions in from from the live chat room so to start things off uh everybody in the chat room start submitting your questions those are going to be filtered over to me and then we'll um we'll we'll get them to read so start submitting those and we'll start off with a pre-submitted here this first one Close is please. What's Are that? you sure you don't want to start with some Avengers Endgame spoilers or <laughs> we should okay. The crazy thing about it is uh Han dies at the end. <laughs> <laughs> that one's right, a couple sorry, years old, so I'm I'm clear on that one. Um and speaking yeah, for spoilers, uh when that Star Wars movie came out, somebody actually took a picture in the movie theater and texted it to me on the Thursday night before the movie oh. was out. Cold. I blocked that person. <laughs> he that was awful. Cold. Yeah, not a good friend. All right, so on to the questions. Uh, our first one is from Justin in Texas, and he's asking, what is the best career advice you've ever been given? And what advice, kind of a two-parter, what advice would you give specifically for moving to Nashville to pursue mixing? Um, I'll answer the second one first. If you're going to move to Nashville to pursue mixing, like, uh, you know, find a girlfriend with a steady job, man. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a really good way to, <laughs> to hack it because <laughs> you're going to be working for free a lot. Right. Um, man, the best career advice I've ever, I've ever been given, that one's tough. Um, that one may boil down to, like, the harder I work, the luckier I get, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Uh, it's been my experience that the people who end up successful in, in just about any field creative or otherwise, to be completely honest are the people that, that, uh, work the hardest, um, yeah. you know, that are hard to kill. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So I've been doing this a long time and and I look back over uh, some years of my career and there was one there was one period where it was like three and a half or four years I was averaging 16 hours a day seven days a week yeah. for three or four years you know mm-hmm. putting in the work so I, I mean just keep at it is probably the best career advice that that I've found moving to Nashville to be a mix engineer um, man to be completely honest the people who are gonna run the music business you know are the in the future or even now are the Beyonce's man, the, mm-hmm. the, the person who can write the song, play the instruments, program the stuff, engineer it, mix it, master it, like the whole nine yards, the people who can do all of that stuff. Those are the ones who are going to win. Um, the most, the most often, mm-hmm. uh, I'm not one of those people. I do some of that stuff, but I don't do all of it. Um, it's hard to be someone who's, insanely good at that you know we can't all be like john fields or greg wells or john shanks or you know mm-hmm. people like that um uh but and that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of opportunity for people who just do one thing really really well it's just uh it's a lot more difficult to break in um now especially because you're competing against someone who can you know take a song from an idea to a finished product um and you know, I, I used to I used to mix for a lot of guys who were specializing in writing and producing. And, you know, and now every, since people are doing everything, there's just less work to go around. Right. Um, the good news is there's a lot more music to go around. So maybe it balances itself out. I don't know. Jury's still out on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is pretty insane. The amount of content being created on a daily basis now. You know, that's it definitely. Is. You see the kind of uptrend in that for sure. Yeah. Whether or not it translates to more work. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, so yeah, because there's a lot of crappy content, so you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it's not all, you know, being taken to to studios or other professionals and stuff because you can do so much at home now. Right. Anywho, uh, a <laughs> very important question here from the chat room. This one is from Dave Stillman. And he says, really, I think the question on everybody's mind is what products allow Mr. Shippen to keep such a svelte beard? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, that's that's super awesome. Uh, I use I use a beard balm from a place called like Catholic Beard Balm Company. Um, and um, I don't know if they're actually Catholics or not. That I don't think that matters. But um, and, you know, and then just a brush, you know, it's just trying to keep it. This is just because I'm lazy. I, I just don't I don't have time to shave. Yep. <laughs> like, it's just easier. All right, let's do another one from pre-submitted stuff. And this one comes from Chad Walbrink from Cincinnati, Ohio. He asks, when is the mix finished for you? Often my clients are happy with the mix, and I still have the urge to tweak things endlessly. So where do you draw the line and call something finished? That's a really good question. I think uh, earlier on in my career, I, I tended to go overboard. Um, you know, I would stay at the studio till like four in the morning. And what I started to realize was there's a, there's an upslope, right? So you're going up the upslope and then you hit the top. And then if you keep going, you kind of keep going down the downslope. And every once in a while, I would find myself with something that was way worse than it was like a couple hours ago. So after doing that a million times, I finally figured out that, you know, you, you should try and do it quicker. You should try and not think think as much um one thing that really helps me on that honestly is like i'm sitting in my studio right now and my console's in front of me and there's these nice big yeah it looks like a busta rhymes video um <laughs> there's these nice big speakers right here the atcs and the pro acts just inside them but over on the side mm-hmm. um i've got a little pair of uh, roger speakers and they're deliberately they're not someplace where I can sit in the middle and sit there and start thinking about, well, if this thing's panned left or this thing's panned right, or maybe if this was moving here, I could do that and offset this. It's like, no, throw it over there. What instrument is speaking? What needs to speak? What doesn't need to be in that section? You know, you, you, you turn off a lot of the analytic stuff and you force yourself into a more creative flow Mm -hmm. as far as what mix needs. Um, because let's face it. I mean, you know, most, most great mixes are, um, kick snare bass vocal one or two other things everything else who cares right you know yeah. it's great that we can all like put on headphones and get off at this little like 
auto pan 16th note delay guitar or whatever but that's not going to make the difference between somebody falling in love with the song or not right so the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing and you know throw in a couple of little flourishes um i've noticed and if you look at some really great producers over the years quincy jones does does this some of the really great stuff that like trevor horn did with seal um uh the Beatles would do this too. There would be one or two little things that caused some sort of shift or some sort of distraction or some sort of, sort of interest, but it wasn't like they were trying to do that all the time. They were focusing on the song. Right. So, you know, focus on the song, focus on the emotion, throw in a few little cool things. If they help great. And then don't spend hours like disappearing up your own ass, you know, fooling around with all kinds of stuff. Right. Yeah. Great advice. Um, Here's a here's a good one. This one's from um, a person in the in the live room. His name is Nathan Holiday, and his question yeah. is on "Smoke a Little Smoke" by Eric Church. Uh, it's one of his speaker tests, and he's asking if you remember how you got the baritone guitar sound so in your face. Um, yeah, that's a great track. I, I loved mixing that. Um, I probably got it in your face by taking a Jay Joyce played baritone guitar and turning it up. Um, you know, that was a long time ago and it was in a different studio. I was mixing, that was mixed on a, on a nine K, um, at a place I was at for a couple of years. Um, and I don't really specifically remember that, but I do know that, um, anything Jay's producing is going to kind of be badass. So, um, you know, he probably just played it and the tone was great and the whole point was just not getting in the way of that. Yeah. You know, if yeah. I had to guess, it might have had a little bit of EQ on it, maybe like some Pultec EQ possibly, but probably not, and maybe a little bit of Cooper Time Cube to help spread it but not smear it, you mm -hmm. know, just to make it pop a little bit. Um, but, yeah, that's yeah, that's a good question. I. I still enjoy that mix. I, I rarely enjoy listening to stuff that I've done, but uh, yeah, that one's really fun. And I actually get a lot of people who say it's a speaker tester. There's a lot of live guys that use it to tune PAs too. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Uh, let's do another one from the live room. Um, this is probably a good one in relation to uh, the charity that you just mentioned. Um, which this is from Jennifer Borman, and she asks, what's a recommended home mixing console to get within a, reach, a reachable budget? So I think I'll expand that, and um, maybe you could even talk about what you guys are doing in those studios. What's a recommended home mixing console? Mm -hmm. um, no console. That's my recommended home mixing console. Um, I, I would say um, whatever DAW you're comfortable in um, is the best one for home by far. Um, we can get into a really crazy rabbit hole discussion about analog summing and this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, if you're trying to do really good work at home, you don't need anything outside of a DAW. Um, and then if you feel, if you start to hit what you feel is a glass ceiling and you want to expand from there, then I would start experimenting with something like the, you know, the dangerous, um, you know, the, I mean, I use it, the dangerous two bus, two bus plus, you know, it's got not only does it have some really great analog summing, it's got some really great bells and whistles on it that you can use to like help your mixes out and try some new stuff, which is awesome. Um, you know, and that and that's where I would I would go from there. The last thing I would ever tell anybody to do is go out and buy an analog console and take on you know all the the time and expense and and all of that stuff when you could be spending time getting um, really good at your craft by just you know working more in right. the box. Right. Great advice. Um, what are some oh, of those? I'm sorry to things? answer your other question. The um, we're we're looking at at a uh, at Song Farm. We uh, we did the first studio. Here you go. I don't know if it'll focus on nice. this Song Farm. Um, yeah. We did the first studio with um, uh, an Apollo, which is an incredible piece of gear. Like yeah, the UA stuff. The plugins are great. The Apollo is solid. The mic pre's are great. Like you know that in a laptop, and you can do almost anything. Right. Um, uh, going forward, we're going to focus more on music creation and some portability. So we may be switching to doing some stuff on iPads and on the Isotope Spire, which is like mm. the fastest way to get 
creative music recorded I've ever seen. Like it's incredible. Yeah. Um, and then it pops right into GarageBand, and you can, or Logic, or whatever you're using, and you can go from there. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a cool box. Um, let's see. So, let's do another one from the pre-submitted here. And this one is also going to be from Chad Walbrink in Cincinnati, Ohio. He asks, "How do you handle setting reverb delay times for songs with multiple tempo changes?" While rare, I find it can be tricky to rely on automation when this sort of thing comes up, as not all parameters automate smoothly. So how do you handle setting reverb delay times for songs with multiple tempo changes? Um, I generally just ignore it. Um, I don't care about reverb times and tempo has have no bearing as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just use whatever reverb makes the, makes the color that I want. Um, you know, tempo for delay, sometimes it's hard. Actually, one of the things that I wish some of these plugin guys would recognize is that as you go through tempo changes, the delay will change and it'll do this weird, like, boing, 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 like bouncing around thing. I wish <laughs> that they had a smoothing function where as it played through, it would just kind of smoothly ramp between one or the other because that can be really annoying. Mm -hmm. um, but man, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I, I set delays. Um, more to the feel i'm i'm i have been known on more than one occasion per day to turn on fab filters timeless two or whatever that delay is and just take whatever pops up stock which is not locked to any tempo at all mm. uh, you know and just tweak stuff if it if it feels good like i'm not gonna again you know <clears throat> so your most res precious resource is time and there's only x amount of hours in the day and if you're going to spend you know, 15 minutes messing around with delay times and pre-delays and all of this and worrying about whether it's going to tempo change or what. If you add that up over the course of your life, you're going to spend 10 years of your life dicking on stuff that no one cares about. Right. So, you know, I would just set, I would set a quarter note and a half note. And if you want to follow tempo, great. And if you don't, you don't. And, you know, and I would just roll. And most of the time it's not going to matter. And if it does matter and you hear it, then just pop in it into automation and, and, you know, and just tweak it. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, just, I don't, I don't pay that much attention to delay times mm -hmm. or cool. to locking it to tempo rather. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, let's roll another one from the pre-submitted. This one comes from Jem in Birmingham, Alabama. Sweet. And... Be him. What up? Jem asks, hi, if you could choose only one tool or app to improve a recording, what would it be and why? One tool or app to improve a recording. Um, can good speakers in a good room be a tool or an app? Yes. You know, uh, a lot of people spend all this time like buying all this gear and then, and I see this on Instagram all the time. There's people who's like, yo, check out my dope studio. And they've got their speakers against a drywall wall, you know, way too far apart or way too close to their face. And the rest of the room isn't treated. And I, I just know by looking at it, it's like, you know what? Your studio sounds like shit. So everything you're doing as far as EQ and compression and balances and all that stuff, you are literally guessing because that room sounds like ass. Mm -hmm. So I would say the most important thing you can do after you buy a pair of speakers and a laptop and an Apollo is to get somebody who can help you or do some learning or call Eric Smith at, uh, at uh, RLX and have them put something together to make your room sound halfway decent. You mm -hmm. know, because if you don't know what you're hearing, you're literally just guessing. Yeah. So yeah. you don't want to run. You don't want to run across the street with your eyes closed. You know, you don't want to run down a New York City sidewalk with your eyes closed, so don't do it with your music. Right. Yeah, that's that's a great answer. The uh, Another kind of important thing about that, um, uh, like like we mentioned, like SonarWorks is, is sponsoring this and everything, but one thing to remember is that um, software can't affect your reverb times in your room. It can't do anything to absorb reflections. Right. or anything like that. So you still have to do some work on your room regardless of, of using software tools and stuff like that. So Yeah, and you know what? It's not 
It's not super difficult. Anything under 200 or 250 depends on the construction and the shape of the room. Anything over that you can treat. Mm -hmm. You know, start putting up by putting up some acoustic absorption and, you know, do some of those old school tricks, man. Like, you know, take a mirror and walk around the room um, with it flat against the walls and any place you can see your speakers you should treat. Um, you know, put your subwoofer in your listening position and your mix position and then crank a tune, you know, and walk around the outside of the room and where the bass feels right, put the subwoofer there. Hmm. Um, you know, like super little simple hacks that, that really cut down on a lot of pain and suffering, non-parallel surfaces or, you know, putting curtains up or just, you know, just the basics, you know, yeah. I would, if people spent enough time, as much time reading about the basics of acoustic design as they spent reading about like plugins or whether the, you know, TX41 T tube matrix switch in the up position matters on the lead vocal, like we would have a lot better stuff. Right. Right. And, you know, I mean, and like it or hate it, I don't use headphones a ton, but a lot of people are listening in headphones. You know, it is the 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 cheapest way to get a pretty great reference is to go out and buy a pair of Audio Technica, you know, what is it, MTH fifties or THM fifties, just the M fifty headphones. They're not expensive. Yeah. They're not like stunningly world class, but they're totally real world and they work great. And there's some people who have done like Zed does all of his dance stuff on those things. There's tons and tons of session players who use those every day. They're a great reference and they're inexpensive and you know i mean that's that's i would highly recommend grabbing a pair of those nice great advice all right um next question pre-submitted this one comes from raymond in fort worth texas word and he says do you use multiple monitors when mixing what are your recommendations and do you have experience with focal monitors I do use multiple monitors when mixing. Um, one of the things that I've always noticed is uh, some speakers work great in some rooms and some speakers don't work great in some rooms. And they can be great speakers. It really is room dependent. Um, for example, the uh, ATC ATM 25s, um, which are great little speakers, they don't sound good in my room. But the ATC 150s, which I use in my room, sound great. You know, I'm I'm I share a space with Infrasonic Mastering, this killer mastering house. They just moved out. To, um, they moved one of their rooms out here. Their principal moved out here, and um, I have ATCs in my room. He has PMCs in his room. We put the PMCs in my room. I didn't like them. We put the ATCs in his room. He didn't like them. They're both great speakers. You know, we're both doing good work on them. So it really is. It's really room dependent. Um, if if at all possible, try and listen to a bunch of speakers and see which ones speak to you, no pun intended. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be in Nashville where I can go to Vintage King or Westlake Pro or, you know, and, and there's a wall of speakers and you can just listen through. And when you're listening to the same thing over and over again through a bunch of different speakers, even if they're not set up correctly, very quickly you're like, I know that is good and that is not good and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, so I have ATC 150s which are massive, and I have a pair of Pro X, you know, the old school Studio 100s, and I use a lot. I use an old pair of uh, Rogers um, uh, LS 35As old BBC monitors for my, you know, over on the side, full range, low low volume listening kind of thing, mm -hmm. and headphones, Audio Technicas and Grados. Um, I have uh, I've cut stuff on Focals. Um, Welcome to 1979 has a cool pair of those dual focals. We cut stuff over there and it came out good. Nice. Um, I haven't honestly used uh, focals like for mixing, mm -hmm. but you have. I can see a pair right behind yeah, you. Yeah, there's a couple there. <laughs> and we were talking about speaker placement on Instagram photos. I'm like... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, <laughs> nice, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I use... I like having a lot of speakers. I, I've I've tried for years and unsuccessfully tried to get um, to get uh, Bob and the guys at Dangerous to to make a Dangerous monitor where I can have like seven pairs of speakers because, you know, I switch out my Pro X. I have Unities, the 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 um, the Rocks. Those are really cool too. And 
you know, a couple little boom boxes and stuff like that. Like I would love to have a million pairs of speakers, but uh, that's just me. I like kind of, kind of mixing stuff up and trying stuff. But mm-hmm. as far as the Focals go, you know, I haven't tried them. I know they're really good speakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's let's go down a little bit of a hole here. So you track in a lot of different rooms, right? Like you you go around Nashville a lot and. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have studios. space in my studio for tracking. My room's just a mix room. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, when I track, I end up at probably like two or three different places in Nashville. Yeah, when you're when you're at those places, I mean, at, at this point, you probably worked at all of them quite a bit. But are you bringing your ATCs with you, or just kind of seeing what's in the room and going for it? Or? No, the ATCs don't move. Um, so I'll bring. I have a pair of Westlakes. Um, uh, old school West Lakes that I use for tracking. So a lot of times we'll bring the West Lakes, um, or I'll bring uh, Pro X or um, the new PMC two two eights. I thought were super kick ass. Like mm-hmm. I love tracking on those. So as long as I have a reference that's pretty decent, and then you know another pair of speakers that can bang. I mean, you cut it Ocean Way. They've got Allen sides, like original Allen sides, massive speakers in the wall. Um, you know, and those are fun to crank up and, and rock and roll. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just go in and I get acclimated to the room and, you know, with a pair of speakers that I'm relatively familiar with and then I'm good to go. Nice. Do you, uh, do you have like a list of reference tracks that you use when you go in to kind of hear what's happening or? I, you know, I keep a, I don't, you know what we should do? We should do a pure mix Spotify playlist of like speaker reference tracks i would love to hear what other people are listening to and like i would love to share some of that but no i've got usually i carry around like a a little flash drive or a dropbox with a handful of mixes that i've done that i know and Mm -hmm. i can listen to 30 seconds of three or four songs and know exactly where the low end and the high end and all of that stuff is yeah yeah so that's that's my that's my hack cool that's a great one uh, let's see. So going on, let's do another one pre-submitted. This one comes all the way from Australia. This is David. Sweet. And David asks, uh, just wondering what you think of UA's Cooper Time Cube versus your real one behind the couch. Yes. It's right over there. Um, well, first of all, David, I love your country. Um, Australia is awesome. Australians are awesome. Uh, I've had nothing but great times down there. I love that place. And the food is ridiculous. And the coffee is killer. Really? Like, everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, even Gloria Jeans, which is like a coffee chain. Like, it's killer. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know what? Uh, this question comes up a fair bit. And I try and be egalitarian about it because, um, uh, you know, if something is better, I want to go for it. Uh and and I remember, and this is probably a few years ago, saying let's try the Cooper Time Cube in the box, and then let's try the out, outboard one. And uh, I found out that for like guitars, which I like to use the Cooper on a lot, I preferred the analog one, probably because it's got you know old Yuri transformers in it and Class A blah blah blah, and mm-hmm. it makes nice things on guitars. Um, but I use the um, I use the UA uh, Time Cube in the box on all the time on things like um, background vocals and stuff like Mm. that um, to kind of like spread them and give them like a cool vibe. So, you know, they're both, they're both useful tools. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Let's see. So I was going to ask you another question about that and it just completely dropped out of my head. So never mind. Uh, Let's uh, let me see what we got in the live room here. Uh, Okay, here we go. So Pat in the live room asks, I'd like to know how you would reproduce your awesome vocal processing in the box with plugins. So I'm sure he's referring to how you blend all the parallel compressors. Yes. Okay. Um, that's a good question. I haven't tried it, but let's guess. Mm-hmm. So they're not actually, when you think of parallel compression, you think of a signal and then you think of a compressor that's blending in. This is, parallel compression insofar as the vocal goes out to like four or five different compressors they're all doing something and then i blend them together Mm -hmm. um so like there's no original vocal and then a parallel like i'm just i'm sending it through a bunch of different compressors with a bunch of different settings to try and get a um a vibe that i like for example 
I was just min mixing this this new artist named Lainey Wilson, and the song was kind of mellow, so I wanted something that was kind of like um, opto kind of deal. Um, I was using my LA2, um, which, by the way, UA has a killer emulation of. Like, their, their LA2 plugin, I actually use that even after I use mine. I use that on the um, compressed thing. But mm -hmm. And then I needed something that would, like, the LA2 had this really beautiful tone, but I need something that would kind of give it a little bit of edge and a little bit of cut through. So I ran through an 1176. So in that in that example, I would take the vocal, I'd put a little EQ on it, get rid of the super sub stuff, make sure there's nothing like 22K and above, because you don't need that garbage. If there's a bad mid-range thing, you can like little dynamic surgery EQ, not a much. And then I would duplicate that and I'd put an LA2 on one track probably a little bit of de-essing, an 1176 with a little de-essing on another, and then maybe molt those into an aux. And on the aux, I'd probably put like a Pultec, mm -hmm. um, some kind of EQ like that. Um, and then, uh, man, right now I've been doing, I've been going through a Neve module, which uh, even with no EQ, puts such an incredible sound, um, just the Class A transformer thing. So put a Neve module on it, maybe give it a click it, a hundred and maybe a click at like 10 K or something like that. And then mm -hmm. at the end of that chain, I've been using a GML compressor, which I stole from a friend and he's never getting back. And if, uh, if George Massenberg, are you out there? Release the plugin, man. <laughs> um, George has an amazing, amazing compressor plugin, a GML compressor plugin that he's had for years and it's killer and he just won't release it. <laughs> right. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe just a little bit of a, a little bit of an extra compressor on the end, like a FabFilter um, Pro L2 or something, just to give it a little, little bit of that deal. Um, that would be my vocal, mm -hmm. um, and then that actually would would get some parallel compression with a Calrec or an old Yuri or something like that. Uh, um, and then after that, it would go into you know a little bit of spatialization stuff and possibly the sugar, um, you know, the sugar plug in with a little bit of high end on it and mm -hmm. whatever other EQ, whatever other EQ he gets. Um, and right now, currently I run all the outboard and I print it back into pro tools. And then I, I can tell you what's, I could probably just look, hang on. Awesome. It's, you know, there's like, oh, I don't have it open. Um, it right now it would have an EQ on it. It would have some, you know, a little bit of dynamic EQ on it. It'd probably have the UAD LA2. Might have a um, a deesser on it. Might have a Metric Halo's channel strip on the end with a little bit of limiting, a little bit of corrective EQ, or maybe paralleling in like a little bit of um, a little bit of really like raging aggressive compression and giving like two or three percent of that. Nice. You know, yeah. a little bit of sugar on the top end. And, you know, I mean, it's just it's it's weird. You just kind of have to mess with stuff until it works. Yeah. But that that huge mess that I just vomited onto this web stream is is a basic idea of how I would do it in the box. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to watch the replay and go back and just like write down the whole chain. Somebody will make yeah. a signal flow chart of it. <laughs> totally. Um so let's let's talk about that a little bit. You uh, one of the cool things about um, definitely about that video and about your process is just how you have all these different pieces of gear that you're just you're using little pieces of each one and just adding adding little bits as you go. Uh, how did you you know arrive at this this point where you're you know blending five compressed vocals together? You know I don't remember when I started doing that. I, I mean I'm I'm pretty much an an audio hoarder. Right. So at one point or another, I've owned just about every piece of gear. I mean, pretty close. I'm sure there's some I've missed and some real esoteric, expensive stuff that no one could afford. But, um, you know, I just I tried a lot of things and I kept the ones that I liked and then I tried to keep making things better. I just wanted a little bit better. So if I found something better. I would switch to that. And you, you just kind of keep going. And what happens is over the course of what now, 20 years, like you see this stuff average and you're like, you know what? Like 99 times out of a hundred, I'm going to put a Rev E 1176 on base. So I'm just going to commit my Rev E 1176 for base. Boom. Yeah. It's on base. You know, it's going to end up there anyway, probably. Yeah. And if there's a song that it doesn't need it, I just bypass it, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, the vocal compressor thing, I think it came about where I was mixing, 
some song and I was like inserting a compressor and I liked what it did to this part, but I didn't like what it did to that part of the vocal. And then I inserted another compressor and I was like, oh, well, that's really cool for this. And it's not really cool for that. And I think at some point I just spread them out on the console and just kind of like mess around with blending them. I was like, oh, that's really cool. And that just became a thing. Yeah. Like I really enjoy doing that. I use them. I, I use them as EQ, um, basically. Right. You know, there's not there's not a ton of EQ on my vocals, really. It's all very broad. Um, so I, you know, if I want something that's a little darker, I'll use my 1176 called Darth because he's dark or, you know, yeah. Obi-Wan is bright. And, you know, I mean, it's like there's all kinds of different permutations. And, and um, if I paid enough attention to technical stuff, we could probably talk about attack and release and the different kind of parts of that. But I don't. Um, you know, I, I just I just go for character and and it takes ten seconds to listen to all the compressors and mess around and then add, have two or three going and like you know kind of just ch audition a couple things and boom done. Yeah, that's yeah, so, great. Nice. Yeah. So just years of collecting gear and just experimenting. Yeah, just yeah trying a bunch of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and and the nice thing about what we've got now with things like Pure Mix is is now you can take advantage of like all the mistakes and all the money that I wasted uh, on all of this stuff and, and uh, shortcut some of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, let's do another pre-submitted here. Uh, let's see, we already did that. So this one comes from Dan Pace in Minaloa, New York. He's asking, how did you get that nice bottom end sound on the lead vocal? And, what do, you, and do you use that for all male vocals? So he's referring to the Dirk Bentley track. Well, um, you know, it's funny. On that record, I am 99.9% .9 sure that the vocal sound... Well, first of all, Dirk's has an incredibly, incredibly great sounding voice. And, and that's something that a lot of people don't know or experience. Um, you know, you get people all the time saying, like, I want my voice to sound like this. I want my voice to sound like that. And they think it's a microphone or a preamp or an EQ setting. But it's not. Dirk's just sounds like that. Yeah. You know? right. the, the, the trick to making him sound great is not getting in the way of him sounding great. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why I, I'm, I'm careful when I can with, um, you know, mic selection. Like, I can – I have a – I have a – vocal chain that I use that I can use on probably 90, 90%, 95% of the people on the planet. It's going to sound great. It's insanely expensive, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it works great. However, Dirks's vocal on that record was not on insanely expensive stuff. It was on a Telefunken tube mic that I want to say, and you can correct me on this because, you know, the newer Telefunkens have a lot of different models. Is it a AR? 51. Oh yeah, I have one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and it was that, and it was going into, uh, the UA, um, uh, the UA like 610, the rack mount 610 with, yeah. uh, I believe the 1176 built into it. And I, I think they had, uh, that Ross had put like some, at my suggestion, put some, uh, better tubes in it. You know, um, mm -hmm. you can upgrade the tubes to like some vintage Mullard or Telefunken or something you can get yeah. off of eBay. Yeah. Um, and when the vocal came to me, it sounded really good, you know, so that yeah. low end just came through the vocal chain. And, you know, I probably didn't EQ it any more than I normally would with a little bit of low and a little bit of high and a little bit of like sparkle and stuff like that. A lot of that comes from Dirks because yeah. he has that voice. And, yeah. you know, and one of the advantages to working with pros, um, you know, or you get into this rarefied air of music is these guys and these women are amazing singers you yeah. know they're that's how they got here like you know darius rucker love or hate the hootie you know he's a great singer especially on yeah. traditional country stuff man he's fantastic um michael mcdonald is michael mcdonald yeah right yeah um you know john mayer is john mayer he sounds like john mayer people are like how can i get my vocal to sound like john mayer i was like be john mayer right, right? Yeah. Um, Dirks is great. Kenny Chesney has an iconic voice, you mm -hmm. know, and that's all, that's just him. That's what he sounds like. So the, yeah. it's not about getting the sound. It's about getting out of the way. 
Yeah. It's always amazing when you hear somebody like that in the live room for the first time too, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh, Oh <laughs> yeah. And you know, I mean, it's, it's not even like, we just worked with a girl named uh, Allison Porter and, and uh, she, uh, she was on the voice and she may have actually won the voice, I think a couple of seasons ago, but mm -hmm. um, man, she just opens her mouth and it sounds great. And there's yeah. another artist named Lucy Silvis, who's one of the best natural singers I think I've ever heard. And wow. I've done a couple records with her and, and, you know, I mean, the vocal on the, not the last record we just did, but the one before that is her on an RCA 77 through a Mog mic pre, that's it. Nice. And it's just, she's just amazing, you know, and you can't teach that. It's, right. it just is. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's do some more from the, from the chat room here. Um, cool. Oh, this is fun. Uh, this is from Greg Lindman in the chat and he would like to know what are the transformers you have plugged into your dangerous gear and how do they work so you showed that in the video a little bit oh yeah um they are western electric transformers nice um rep 111c nice and the race to ebay starts <laughs> <laughs> uh you know what i mean i honestly i have um I have a bunch of I have a bunch of stuff. In fact, my friend Devin Powers, when they were working on, um, there's this really cool plugin called True Iron. Hmm. It's made by a company called Kazrog, but it was based on um, my buddy Devin, who lives out in L.A. He would always run stuff through different transformers, and he actually made me a box. Awesome. Oh, you know, man. that's just transformers and, yeah. and XLRs. And these are really cool, like, Maloki transformers. Wow. But I've got these. I've got Telefunkins. I've got um, UTCs. I've got the Western Electrics. Um, yeah. They all have a different color or character. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started experimenting with putting them on the mix bus. I'm pretty sure the Western electrics were actually used to equalize or, or balance telephone lines running across country. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the same as anything else. Like they're, they just have a character. They saturate at certain points. Um, they kind of put a color or a flavor into it. I like the way it sounds. And the beautiful thing about having a dangerous liaison is you can put a bunch of different transformers on and just go click, 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 right. click, click, and pick the one that sounds the best. So yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. where that whole thing came from. That's awesome. Were those input knobs on the front of it? There, like an input output knob. I saw two knobs I think on the front of that switches. box. They're just switches. Okay. Yeah, they're just switches on off. Nice. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, um, in the video you showed that too. You had some on pigtails and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. every once in a while I'll get a vocal where it's like I can whatever I do I can't fix. Like maybe there's a harshness to it or something. Mm. I've got a couple of transformers on pigtails. Sometimes just running it through a transformer that's gonna kind of distort correctly, and it gets it makes something harsh turn kind of creamy, or it just gives it. It's just flavors, you know. Yeah. It's just yeah. flavors. It's the same as sitting there with a with a guitar and plugging into like six different amplifiers. Like you know, you're just getting different kind of flavors. Right. Yeah. So, awesome. And I would encourage you know some of my favorite transformers are not old and not expensive they're bare buyer made buyer made some little peanut they're called peanut transformers hmm. they're tiny but they sound cool hmm. um half the sound of the 1176 and the la3a is you know those transformers and then a lot of companies make really good transformers that are copies of the old ones so i mean yeah. just you know running audio through anything could make it really cool right right if uh <laughs> if anybody wanted to try this to you know just go on and get some get some transformers off of ebay and try to try to build something like this do you have anything that you recommend yeah. i mean you you're probably not going to go wrong with utc or the western electrics i i think the western electric the 111 c's are pretty common and not super expensive mm -hmm. and i find like they sound really good on the whole bus you know mm. so that might be a good one to try or you know anything the the you want them to be line transformers obviously you don't want to like run from like 600 ohm to like 50,000 ohm or whatever you usually keep it 600 to 600 mm -hmm. um but yeah that's that's i would i would try utcs or um or triads or the western electric awesome cool yeah uh the first time i ever experienced that was fab has this old neumann mastering eq 
uh, it's like a W492 or something like that. Yeah. And he doesn't use it for EQ at all. He just like turns it on on the liaison and it's just instantly like, whoa. <laughs> like that's the sound of the transformer that's crazy yeah it is that those are those are really cool um you know i mean transformers just they just have a sound Mm -hmm. um you know it's it's the same as changing a pickup and you know having different pickup in a guitar you can switch it's the same guitar and everything it's just a totally different tone right yeah it's 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 a cool little hack it's fun yeah awesome also Uh, it also helps you it also helps you throw a little bit of analog distortion into stuff so I would I, I I get to I don't have to mix in the box, but if I did, especially on rock stuff, I would be curious about running it through something with a transformer, you know, just to get that vibe. In fact, I on my mix bus, um, I run through. Got to look at these. VP twenty eight, the Cappy VP twenty eights. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I have those on my mix bus. They're at Unity Gain. It's just it's like a class A unity gain and some transformers and they sound wicked cool so they're on my yeah. mix bus all the time like just that boom awesome yeah yeah cool um i actually remembered my question from earlier when my brain died cool. um so we were talking about the ua plugins but this this kind of ties into what we're, what we're talking about now um one of the cool things from that video and there's a, a little bit of an excerpt on uh youtube about this that we made from the video, uh, like when you're using the Helios, you have all these these cool little tricks for these plugins, like the Helios trick where you just turned it on at 60 and you got something yes. out of it. You were like yes. right between I, 10 I, and 15, uh, had something. And... So the story on that, I think, was when UAD did the plugin, they sent it to a couple of people to beta test, and one of them was Richard Dodd. And Richard, you know, he's been around the block and he kicks all kinds of ass and uh he said well it's a good sounding helios plugin but you're missing this one feature because on the original helios when you click that in it would add this nice low end even if you didn't add any gain Mm -hmm. so i guess they added it i don't know um i still use that they um they they came out with a newer version of the helios and i don't think it does it the same yeah so yeah, I, I tried it. The older version of the Helios. I, I just used yeah. it. I just used it yesterday. I use that on guitars all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's such That's a cool awesome. little trick. You had another one. Uh, I think it was on the mid range uh, between like ten and fifteen, where it just kind of pops all of a sudden. Oh yeah, on the uh-huh. Helios. If you're depending on the EQ, like three point five, four, somewhere between three and a half and six, mm-hmm. like you get that gain up there, and you're like, shit, I'm turning this up way too loud. But somewhere between ten and 15 or 10 and 12 it like it just gets really really cool and i don't know why yeah. obviously it's source dependent right but mm-hmm. um yeah I, I mean there's that's one of the beauty about analog gear and one of the great things about a company like ua or like what you know dirk's doing with um with bx like the the really hardcore modeling is they find all these weirdnesses yeah you know um but yeah i love the little random stuff that stuff is awesome yeah yeah it's cool you seem to know a lot of it it's pretty fun. Uh, let's see here. So let me grab another question from our live room. And if, okay, so this one's cool. This is a uh, Brett Svensson in the live room. If you could buy one outboard compressor for vocals, what would you get? Um, wow, that's tough. Uh, probably an 1176. Yeah. Um, and I say that because you can use it on just about anything, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's not great on everybody. Uh, and if you're doing, it really depends on the style of music you're doing. Like the out, the outboard compressor that I use to cut vocals almost all the time is a tube tech CL one a, mm. and it doesn't have a ton of character and it won't screw anything up. And a lot of these, a lot of the times when I'm cutting some of these people like i just want to get out of their way so i'll use that to not screw anything up if i want to screw something up you know i'll use an 1176 or i'll use an la2a um you know that's that's the vibe um the most impressive budget style vocal compressor that i've found well cappy makes a cappy makes an 1176 like a fet style limiter and a 500 rack that sounds really cool Hmm. um but um Steve Furlot makes one called the Brute Inward Connections, the Brute. Yeah, um, yeah. And I've used that a ton on vocals, and it's killer. Like nice. it is, it is a fantastic compressor for vocals, and it's you know, it sits in a 500 rack, and it's not super expensive. Yeah, awesome. When you're tracking a vocal, how much uh, how much are you hitting it? It depends on the song. It depends yeah. on the vocalist. Right. Um, 
You know, and uh, to be completely honest, though, I just thought about this. If you really would just want to cheat it and have everything in one box, just buy a Shelford channel. Like, you know, yeah. it's got a great preamp. It's got the best parts of the, you know, the old school Neve EQs, and it's got like a 2254 compressor in it. Like, if you can't do it with that, you can't do you can't do it. Right, right. Yeah, it's a great box. So I, I would be tempted, if I was on a budget, before I bought a vintage 1176, I'd be tempted to pick up a Shelford channel and have, like, all that yeah. power. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something to think about, too, right? Because it's, it's way more fun to go after the, the big pieces, the ones with the big names and stuff. But sometimes if you kind of look at, you know, what else is available, you can get a lot more for the money, and a lot more mileage. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, the one thing that I have learned is is if you're in this for the long haul, you're a lot better off buying one thing that you know you're going to use forever mm -hmm. than buying a crappy this or a kind of halfway decent that or, you know, or whatever. And I'm I'm not going to throw any brand names under the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, but, like, you know, if you have one great microphone you're gonna have it forever and that yeah. could be a, that could be a um uh you know a manly or it could be a u47 or a 67 or you know something like that and you're gonna have it forever and ever and ever mm -hmm. um you know there's a lot of kind of cheaper kind of knockoff kind of halfway decent whatever and some of them are really good you know, yeah. I'm not saying yeah. that price has to matter. I mean, I use I use SE mics on every tracking session that I do, and I have access to anything. Yeah. Um, you know, but some of those mics work better than the really expensive stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but you know, if if I could do it all over again, I would have spent a lot more time not just buying anything, but buying something that I knew I was going to use forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's good advice. Uh, David Stillman in the live room asks, how do you deal with extra sibilant vocals? Uh, and he says, often recorded through inexpensive condensers in the suboptimal room. Uh, do you just simply DS or do you have surgically Q? Yeah, so the Chinese microphone in a drywall room scenario, which mm -hmm. sucks <laughs> um, and happens more often than not, you know, especially with people who are recording at home. Um, singers really get off on some of these crappy microphones because it sounds really exciting, but what they're actually hearing is distortion. Yeah. And when you really start to focus the vocal up in, in your face, it gets really rough. So there's a couple of tricks. One is like 600 de yeah. yeah. <laughs> all working at different points. Um, uh, most of the time when I'm using outboard, I'm running it through a DBX902. Mm. Um, you know, those are the best analog to DSers ever, and they also make compressors sound really good. I don't know why. Even hmm. bypassed, if you run an LA-2A into a DBX-902, it sounds better. Hmm. Termination? Nope. Um, I'm on weed? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> like, it just does. So, um, a lot of times I'll do that. Sometimes I'll do that transformer trick. You know, I'll insert a transformer and see if it'll react to that certain frequency. Hmm. Um, the Soothe plugin. Um, yeah. Was it oak sound or yeah. oak sound or whatever you call it, man? That thing can be a lifesaver. It goes into distortion pretty quick, so you got to be careful. But um, that's a way to fix it. Uh, it's Six hundred DSers right there. Yeah, but it's not really. Know, I mean, it's it's that yeah. or the yeah. new Fab Filter EQ. You know, you can get real specific on on different bands and make them dynamic, so it'll like dig in mm -hmm. to stuff like that. Um, you know, sometimes sometimes you just have to slam it through some distortion or some old piece of outboard gear and it gets dull and then you add it back in after those frequencies have been tamed. Hmm. You know, there's a bunch of a bunch of tricks about making that happen. Actually, I think Michael Brower told me about this trick one time. Take um take the vocal, split it. On the split vocal, EQ out everything except like the biting high end hmm. limit the crap out of it flip the phase on that signal and then blend it in to the regular vocal and hmm. sometimes what that'll do is it'll kind of out of phase sort of compensate for the harshness and it still keeps some air but it kind of fixes some of the harsher stuff um that's something that's always worth trying i use that every once in a while so wow cool trick there's a, yeah there's a thought yeah yeah 
thinking outside of the box there. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool. All right, let's do another one here. Um, let's see. So I'm going to butcher the name. I'm super sorry. But uh, GS Talk Studio. Do you go Brower like with different main buses or how tracks and groups fold into the mix bus? So while we're talking about Michael. <laughs> no. Next question. Awesome. Next question. No. Great. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Mike does, um, yeah, Mike does his like multiple buses and then he blends them. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really, I do a handful of parallels. Like I parallel vocals and bass and drums. Um, and then some goes through the SSL, some goes through the dangerous and stuff like that. But no, I don't break it out into like ABCD bus like Mike does. Right. Cool. Uh, Paul J. Toth asks, if you could describe your parallel crush method and in particular, what settings or compressors would make an effective crush? Ooh, um, well, I don't think the webcam will reach over there. I I actually think I was just talking to Dave Durr a couple weeks ago and I was telling him that I've been using distressors as parallel drum compressors forever and ever. And he said, send me the settings. I'll put it on the website. So I sent him the settings. I assume they're on the website. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's right here. I don't think it'll reach, but if you want to zoom in over there, there's distressors right in front of you, and whatever that setting is, you know, mm-hmm. you can screenshot it. Or if you want to put yeah. it up for Pure Mix, we can, um, we can do that. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you send me a photo of it, we'll post it in the uh, the Facebook group. That'd be cool. Yeah. Okay. I can totally do that. That'll be uh, that'll be fun. Awesome. Cool. Um, you just so gave me I, this. I oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, you just gave me this really great idea for a movie where we'll take that camera and go run around in the woods and we'll look for a witch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that if it'll go black and white. <laughs> so we'll send you the drum settings. Um, yeah. uh, bass, my bass parallel is an old RCA tube thing. Um, it's probably more for character than it is for compression. And the vocal parallel is a is a cow wreck. Um, you know, which is kind of like an SSL or an 1176 or an API-ish kind of style parallel. And I have no idea what the settings are. It's probably, you know, slow attack, fast release, just something to give it a little extra character. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm going to take a left turn here and ask you um, some, like, some day-to-day questions. Okay. So uh, let's just, yeah, let's just start there. What does a normal day look like for you? Um, this is the point where you lie and you give your, like, your ideal day, right? Wake up at 6 a.m. and go for a run. (laughs) Well, I do wake up at 6 a.m. Um, and, uh, an ideal day, I'm actually up at, like, 5 or a little bit after 5, um, to get in some exercise and some, some meditation. Um, but on, you know, a a not great day, I'm up at 6 or 6.15 and, you know, a little coffee, a little email, hang out with the kids, uh, and then they take off for school. And then depending on the day or depending on what I have to do, I'll have morning meetings or I'll sit there and bang out some emails or some stuff that I have to do or I'll head to the studio early and start working. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've been realizing more often than not recently that one of the hardest things to do is to stay in, to get into a flow state and to stay in it, whether it's spending time with your family or your your significant other or mixing or thinking about business stuff or doing all of that so what i'm trying to work on now is to like once i get into a flow state on mixing i don't want to respond to anything like yeah. my phone's on do not disturb i don't have email up i don't want to browser up i just want to kind of get in the flow state because it's so easy nowadays to jump back and forth and hop on Instagram and look at Facebook and read the news and the browser and have a TV playing and all of that distraction. Yeah. And that means you're not actually putting a hundred percent of your attention into what you're doing. So, um, that's a bad idea. So what I'm trying to do is segment it and sometimes it gets you into trouble. Like I, I answer email now, like once a day. In Mm -hmm. fact, I think I'm going to put it in my email signature. Like I look at email once a day, usually in the morning, if you need something and it's important, don't email me because I won't get it until tomorrow. Yeah. Um, you know, um, it's, yeah, trying to do that. And I, I work straight through lunch. I never go out to lunch. Um, I just bring food. And, you know, I work pretty hardcore. And, like, today today's a Friday. So after we get done with this, I'm going to get into another mix. But I'll probably knock off around 6, might grab a drink with a buddy, um, uh, 
supposed to grab a drink with a guy named Evan, who I totally forgot to text back, so I should probably text him as soon as we get off this. Um, Evan Weatherford, a killer drummer in town. Um, So I might go grab a beer with him, and then I'll be home and hang out with the family and have dinner and, you know, do the Friday night thing. And when I get home, also, I shut my phone off. Yeah. You know? There's no such thing as a musical emergency. Right. So, like, you know, people can wait. I want want my time, too, because when I'm giving you... When I'm giving you your time, if I'm mixing a song for you, you get 100%. Yeah. So when it's my time, I want 100%. Right, right. Um, and obviously that gets thrown into a cocked hat every once in a while because there's deadlines and there's this, that, and the other thing. But, um, mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's a general overview. I've been trying to get to bed, if at all possible, by like 10 o'clock yeah. so I can get up early and, yeah. you know, keep going. Awesome. Yeah, great answer. There's a lot of good work-life balance advice in there, you know trying yeah uh has it has it always been that way for you where you were able to kind of shut off at six and go have a normal life no no not at all i used to work until two three four in the morning all the time you know i started to realize that i can get more done between eight and noon than i can get done between noon and eight so like you know also there's a lot of studies that show that you're a lot more creative early um you know, and I know a lot of people hmm. are like, that's garbage because I, I, I don't get creative until like, you know, five or six o'clock at night. And that's fine. The, the whole idea is identifying what works for you and then yeah. working your life around to make sure you're maximizing your best self. Right. You know, right. Um, I, I get decision fatigue, you know, when I'm by the time I start to hit like six o'clock, seven o'clock, I realize that I'm I can't focus and I'm not making good decisions and it's a heck of a lot better for me to just go home. Yeah. Get up early the next day, come in and I I'll do in thirty minutes what would probably have taken me two hours to do at the end of the last day because I just I I'm burned through all my decision making. Right. You know? Yeah. So I read a lot, um, and I'm really fascinated by things like getting things done, methodology, essentialism, mm-hmm. stoicism, decision fatigue, stuff like that. All that stuff is really, really real. And if you want to if you want to work at the top of your game, you have to recognize like what you're good at and what you're not good at and maximize the first one and minimize the second one, you know, and then you get the best results. Yeah. Do you he have a um... distracted by his telephone? <laughs> As he picks up the text. Uh, do you have any any places, like anything you recommend, any books or anything like that for people? Oh, yeah. I have a whole list. Um, yeah. uh, you know where it's probably easiest place to find it is go to, uh, there's a website called a aminorinreality.com. Mm-hmm. This is a college-level course that I co-teach with my entrepreneur friend, Mark. Somewhere on that website is a list of recommended reading, but... You know, it's Seth Godin and Purple Cow and, Mm -hmm. you know, GTD and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and, uh, you know, A Thousand True Fans and um, Essentialism and, like, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff like that. Um, I've been reading the Stoics lately, uh, Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus, and Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of really cool stuff to say uh, about concentrating on what paying attention to what you can control and not paying attention to what you can't control because that's the other aspect of this business as a whole is we all have imposter syndrome you know the sooner you grasp the fact that absolutely everybody who is doing creative work thinks that at any moment someone's you know anyone's going to turn to them and be like you don't know what the fuck you're doing do you i found you out we all feel that the richest most successful artists in the world these people are worth hundreds of millions of dollars they feel that so you're gonna feel it and it's fine accept it it's part of the human condition work through it you know and using some of these techniques are a great way to do it um perfect example decision fatigue the first step in getting things done is get everything out of your head and on a piece of paper or into todoist or you know anywhere out of your head so you don't have all this stuff buzzing around when you think of it dump it when you get a chance later, you can label it, you can action it, you can toss it, whatever, you can delegate it, but you know, just get it out of your head. Yeah. Same works with mixing, too, by the way. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from my mentor, Rick, and he said, when you're listening to a song and you hear something that you need to change, change it right then, right. because you'll forget it if you keep going. You know, Just stop, change it, fix it, keep going. You know? mm-hmm. that's, and that's great advice. That works for real life, too. 
Yeah, that one actually, that one really, really resonated with me. I started doing that on mixes after um, after I saw that in your video, and it was it's something that really, really helped me out, and it also made me feel a little bit less um, overwhelmed at times during mixes if I felt yeah. like I had a lot of stuff to get done. Uh, if I, you know, just stopped and listened to myself and said, okay, that thing's bugging you, just deal with it now. And wouldn't worry about like, well, I was working on vocals, so I'll come back later. That one really helped out. So definitely good Yeah, advice. it's a very effective uh, strategy. Um, another thing that I do um, is I love whiteboards. Mm. I keep a whiteboard mm -hmm. <laughs> on nice. my console. <laughs> mm -hmm. And... As I'm sitting there, you know, especially if a producer's talking through stuff or we're on the phone, I can just sit there and write it down. If I think about stuff, the beauty about it is I'm, sometimes I'm mixing and I'll think about, oh, crap, I got to go fix that lock or I got to, you know, get my daughter's something or I just think of something. Mm -hmm. I can just dump it on the whiteboard. I don't have to grab my phone because if I grab my phone and put in to do it, then I'm probably going to look at email or, you know. I just throw it on the whiteboard. By the end of the day, there's a bunch of stuff on the whiteboard. I can just put it in my phone or take a picture of it. You know, it just keeps it out of the way. Right. And that thing costs, you know, it costs what, like 12 bucks on Amazon. It was a great investment. Yeah. Great idea. Awesome. Uh, so along with mixing, you also have some other stuff that you're involved in. So I do. You, you have uh, some restaurants, correct? Um, I'm an investor in a couple mm -hmm. of hospitality projects. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, just trying to, you know, you want to diversify and, but you know, my involvement yeah. in that kind of stuff, other than some kind of startup stuff and some, you know, creative strategy and, and, uh, marketing stuff is, is pretty minimal. Once you get it yeah. up and going, it just goes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, it's, it's something that's unique about you that, uh, I've seen talked about here and there that, um, you do a really good job of the diversification. And I think that that's something that uh, people can learn from. So pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely something to, to consider, mm -hmm. um, you know, like uh, you got to concentrate and you got to get good at what you're good at, but um, you know, you, you can't let it be the exclusion to all else. And that could just apply to like, you know, you want to be a great mixer. Who's miserable, spend right. all your time in the studio and don't spend any time with your, you know, significant other don't spend any time with your kids don't spend any time with your friends mm -hmm. um and you might actually get to be the best and if that's what you care about that's great but you might also be incredibly miserable which i you know the pay the the trade-off is is up to the individual i guess yeah sure yeah great question or uh, great answer there the uh so let's do a couple more questions and then we'll we'll kind of wrap it up here uh so if you guys sure. have any more any more questions, make sure you get them in now. Uh, put them in the chat room here. So let's see. Um, <laughs> uh, Brett would like to know, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? As we're talking about you know, balance. Uh, <laughs> speaking of work-life balance, um, actually, very few. I, uh, I drink coffee in the morning before I get going, and occasionally depending on the day, I'll take like a, an afternoon bump, like, you know, two o'clock, yeah. you know, shot of espresso or, or something like that. But that's it. Yeah. Like I, I, I've kind of weaned myself away from, from doing the Dave Grohl fresh pot scenario where you just wound <laughs> up. Yeah. Honestly, it screws with you sometimes. Like right. it, it heightens anxiety. Um, you know, it makes it harder to concentrate. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's just, it's not what's ideal for me. Obviously, it's working for Dave Grohl, you know, so to each his own. <laughs> right. All right, cool. So we got another one from uh, Guest Talk. Do you get your mixes to sound finished without mastering or preview and deliver with a limiter or a mastering chain? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I mix them until they sound good to me. Um, when I deliver mixes... More often than not, we will just tap the level very slightly with um, isotope, ozone, uh, whatever the most recent version is, and only the limiter. Mm -hmm. No EQ, no spatialization, none of that garbage. Um, it's never on the mix. It's just for like MP4 delivery. Mm. And most of the time, it's just like, okay, 
Somebody sent us a rough mix that sounds like it got run through a rat pedal, so we have to send the mix back somewhere in the ballpark of level, or they'll be like, I don't know, man, it's just not as exciting. It's like, no, it's just not twice as loud. Right. Uh, you know, that's a rabbit hole that everybody goes down to, down, down through. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. If you want to, I mean, stereo speaker salesmen have known this for years. If you have two sets of speakers in the stereo showroom, the one that you want to sell to the customer, you just make that one one dB louder and they will buy it. Right. You know, this is the way yeah. human hearing works. Um, you know, so no, I don't obliterate it. Um, I am not one of those guys who's like, my mixes are perfect. The mastering guy shouldn't touch them. I love sending mixes to uh, Pete Lyman or Andrew Mendelson or Ted Jensen, and they come back, or you know Chris Athens or Garinger, or all these killer guys, and they come back sounding better. I love that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. As long as it doesn't come back sounding worse, I'm cool. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't deal with the mastering thing. I, uh, I have thought about messing around with it just because. I think you just need multiple days. A lot of the times when I'm mixing, though, you know, like right now I've got probably four projects running concurrently, and I got to keep moving mixes out. If I could sit on it for a day, come back the next day, and maybe do a little EQ and a little compression and all that, I might be able to get a little bit better. But, you know, the stuff that I've gotten to a point now with the stuff that I'm doing, you know, we're not really doing many moves in mastering that are more than a third or a half a dB of EQ. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like, let go and let God move on to the next song. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, on average, how how many songs are you mixing in a day, or how fast are you moving it through? Really, mix? It totally depends on the project. It yeah. totally depends on the project. Yeah. Sometimes I do two songs a day. Sometimes I do one song. And it takes a day or a little bit longer than a day. A lot of times, if it's really complicated, I'll go until either I'm tired or I'm just sick of it, and then I'll stop. I might even start another song, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'll come back in in the morning and pull that song up with a fresh perspective. Yeah. And a lot of times, the thing that I was struggling with, that's another thing. The guys you know, asking this question and saying about going late, try this. Next time you're frustrated on a mix, instead of continuing to hammer on it, just close it mm -hmm. and start a new mix and come in the next day and maybe listen to your new mix and maybe get that to a point where you're kind of cool with it and close it and open the old one, this the first one, and you will instantly be like, oh, this is what I was doing wrong. I need to fix that and that and this drum. You know, the drums are too loud and this is too bright and like da 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 Like it's so much faster than if you're sitting there slogging on it because, again, we're human. When you hear something over and over again, you get used to it. Yeah. That's why, like, you can work on a mix until you think it's perfect, and as soon as the artist or producer walks in the room and you hit play, you'll hear six things that you wish you had done to it. And you're like, why did I yeah. not hear that? <laughs> it's a perspective shift. So mm -hmm. shift your own perspective by just closing the damn thing. Go for a walk. You know, go do emails for 15 minutes. Like, go out, you know, out of the mm -hmm. room and do emails. Like, you know, do something to distract yourself and then come back to it and give it a fresh listen. Mm -hmm. The overnight thing, I think, is huge. Yeah. Yeah, great advice. Awesome. Looks like uh got a couple more in. Uh so oh. Uh actually yeah, you just kinda mentioned this, but maybe we'll repeat it for him. It was uh Kevin Gilroy asks, Who do you use for mastering? Kevin Gilroy. Isn't isn't that one of the guys? He was who one was of our winners, winners. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> um Well, uh there there are a lot of people that are really good. Um uh I will give you a couple of names. Um, uh, there's, I mean, everybody knows some of the guys that I get to use. So like Ted Jensen and Greg Calby and uh, Pete Lyman and Andrew Mendelson and Chris Geringer and, um, you know, guys like that, like, you know, just fantastic guys, Adam Ann. Um, and uh, Brad Blackwood in Memphis is killer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Dan Scheich, he used to, he actually, way back in the day, he was my assistant. He's got a place here in Nashville called Tone and Volume. He's doing amazing work. Um, Dan Bachigalupi at Infrasonic, he just joined the staff at Infrasonic, and he's doing great stuff. John Baldwin, um, you know, and I said, like, Andrew Mendelson at Georgetown, and Jim Domain at Yes Master, which has to be one of the coolest mastering studio names ever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of great guys. Uh, I think probably at this point, most of my stuff is, is, is Ted or Pete Lyman at Infrasonic um, or Andrew Mendelson at Georgetown, depending on the project. Mm -hmm. Is Pete over there with you? Like you he said, is. you yeah, share the building he, uh, there. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. he moved out about a year ago from LA and and built a mastering room right next door to me. So you know, it's awesome. it's incredibly tempting to just walk down the hallway and master something, but yeah, he's super busy. So you know, it's yeah. hard to get him. Right, right. Yeah, I was curious if do you attend mastering sessions? Never. Yeah. I uh I have never been able to sit in a mastering room and actually have a clue what I'm hearing. Yeah. You know, right. I'd rather listen to it in my room. Um, right. You no, know, I have attended, but I sit there like an idiot. So, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. if they've got good snacks, great. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, I don't, I, I can judge it in my room a lot better than I can judge it yeah. anywhere else. Well, with Pete, you guys could just run a couple of lines down the hallway. And... <laughs> We've been talking about that, actually. I think we're going to do yeah. some really fun stuff here. We're going to start doing some, like, live to lathe recordings. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, I mean, you could, you could just run, you could run lines. But, I mean, again, like, who knows when I'm going to be done and when right. he's going to be done. Half the time I walk over there, he's, like, cutting vinyl or something like that. So, you know, mm-hmm. you just kind of have to catch his catch can. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's I will awesome. I'll say this: like a, a good mastering engineer makes a makes a huge difference. I see a million guys online that's like, I will master your song for ten dollars, or yeah. you know, at at that point, it's like you know, okay, just send it to Lander if you don't care. Right, right, yeah. Um, there's there's something interesting in there too. Uh, how many how many suites are in the place that you're at if you're with Infrasonic, and are there other people working out of that building? There's me and 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 uh, my engineer Michael, who's got mm-hmm. a little like edit suite for setting stuff up and fixing stuff and whatever. And then yeah. Infrasonic's got uh, got the main room and the B room where Dan works. And yeah. then um, we also have an archive and transfer room here with a bunch of like analog and digital tape machines and barrel conversion and Pro Tools and Nuendo and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So you have like a little community there. You know, there's other yeah. guys around and, yeah, and all that, which is nice. Yeah, hang out, which is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Is that um, is that something that you love about Nashville as well? Just the community down there, and I mean, you can throw a stone and hit a studio in a lot of places. Yeah, well, I mean, the best thing about Nashville, as far as community goes, is the people. So, yeah. um, like everybody in Nashville works together. There's no, there's never been an issue. Like, I'm happy to refer people to other engineers that live here and you know and they refer me to their clients and if somebody gets called to do something that they know somebody else has been doing you know you'll get a call and be like hey man these guys just called me is it cool like mm-hmm. if we do this like it's, is it all good and it's a great community we all hang out on a fairly regular basis and get food and get drinks and you know mm-hmm. it's it's fantastic yeah yeah it's awesome it's a uh, it's always fun when we're shooting down there if we're uh down like in in berry hill you can just kind of walk down the street and say hi to ryan hewitt and <laughs> yeah pretty, pretty everyone's nuts. right there blackbird's yeah. right there ryan's right there vance is there mitch yeah. paul like you know uh dave kamuski like all these guys it's great yeah. yeah it's a cool area uh we have a very important question they're asking where you got your glasses <laughs> um i got my glasses in la uh they're fiction by I- la iWorks you know, nice. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I got him in some like random store. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I think when we <laughs> get ourselves down to asking where you got your glasses, it's a good time to wrap up. So. <laughs> 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 cool. So uh, just going to do a couple quick little housekeeping things here. Um, for everybody watching that's a pro member, we just want to remind you guys that Sugar is available now and it's free with your Pyramix subscription. So if you're a subscriber, you can download that plugin and you'll get your license for it be That's sure you cool. check it out we also just uh we had a uh, another live event uh, about a little over a week ago with fab that he mixed an entire song using sugar and went over a lot of questions that people had of it uh, moving on also this week we released a new video with fab and that video is called song structure explained so fab goes through and explains the building blocks of songs uh ways that people have classically built things like verses and choruses together he talks about things like verse through or uh, through composed uh, song structure so definitely check that one out there's a ton of information in that video he analyzes over 30 songs and then there's a quiz for you to take at the end it's pretty cool cool uh and let's see last but not least we just launched a giveaway with sonable so you can enter for free on that just go to the website go under giveaways click on the sonable link and you can enter to win the entire eq package from them a special eq package from them so yeah i think think that about does it um so awesome 
Reed, thanks for doing your video. It was super fun. It's a really, really fun video on Pure Mix to do. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, just thanks for your time. Thanks for doing this. It, it means a lot that you would take time out of your day to talk to everybody and, and all that. So thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love what I love what you guys do and I love the community. So I'm I'm really honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Awesome. Happy to have you. Well, cool. All right. Uh till next cool. time. Later. Thanks, Reed. <laughs>